Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another session of our live virtual training. My name is Jay. Nice to meet you all. I'm one of the education specialists here at LMN and your host for today. So I'm really excited to show you what LMN can do for you, how to use LMN to achieve the maximum potential for your business. And in today's session, we'll be speaking about the budget and business planning. So you made your way to our training and you might be wondering, what are we going to be covering in the next two hours and so? Well, as a landscape company using a business management software and as a starting point, you need to build your software account with your own numbers, forecast your sales and those related costs so that our software gets ready to help you achieve your sales goals. So it's fair to know that both the budget and price list are a one-time setup portion of our software. Once that is set up, you can operate with estimates, jobs, invoicing, and much, much more. So our training for today is going to have two main parts. The first is where we're going to learn all about the budget. And then in the second half, my colleague Chris is going to jump in to quickly go through your price list tool that you need to build in place to start estimating. So I guarantee you by leaving this training today, you're going to be able to understand the relationship between both the budget and the price list tool. So let's go ahead and get started and start talking about our main game plan for today's session. So to begin with, we're going to work together and show you how to forecast all of your sales targets within the budget for the upcoming year. So I'm going to introduce you to the entire concept of having a budget and the key importance for building this and accurately forecasting your targets for the upcoming year. Once we've gone through that, we're then going to plan what are all the key elements that will contribute into a successful budget. So this will include all the labor, equipment, material, along with your subcontractor job related costs. And we're also going to outline all of the different overhead expenses to make sure we're recovering them through our estimates. So this is a super important topic. So I'm going to spend a lot of time and take my sweet time going through that section as well. Finally, on the budget side of things, I'm going to show you once all of that data is inputted within your company-wide budget, how you can analyze your budget data in order to drive your profit. Now, as we move into the second part of today's training, Chris is going to go through the price list, explain all the key components, and how information can be added to start estimate. Chris will also discuss higher cost overhead recovery, and profit will all come together to give you that price per item. So the main objective here when it comes to the beginning half of today's training, when we talk about the budget, I want to discuss what a budget is, why we need to have one, and what is the primary objective for having a budget in the first place. So this is going to be the key area or uh, items of consideration when it comes to our main game plan for this training. Now, as always, if this is your first time attending one of our live virtual trainings, definitely make sure if you have any questions for me to go through the chat or the Q&A. Uh, more than happy uh, to work through those. I uh, can do the same as well for Chris in the second half, and we'll be more than happy to work through those with you. Now, if your account is uh, currently going through onboarding and uh, you're not, everything is fully customized to your business needs as of just yet. Not to worry if you do come across any account specific or confidential related questions to make sure you save them for your next onboarding meeting. And with that being said, time now to start exploring the budget together. So to begin with, why is it important to create an actual budget? Well, that budget will be the foundation of your business. So it's going to really give you the confidence in pricing your work. That means no more guesstimating on how much you should be charging or how much you're going to be earning. At the end of the day, you'll know exactly what your customer pricing will be on every estimate that you build. At the same time, the budget will give you a clear plan for hiring. So you can ensure you have enough to pay existing employees, plan for new ones, and even plan out things like wage increases or bonuses. So as you see our sales increasing, Generally, we need more labor power to produce that work, and this will really help you to get a clear plan on how to budget for the year. At the same time, it will also help you to invest wisely. So once you know your company numbers, you can confidently purchase new equipment, spend money on any of those office renovations that you're looking to do, 
or purchase any additional things you might need for your company. And finally, your budget will help you to reduce a net profit every single year. So it's gonna help you create a plan, set those targets, and make sure that you reach them. So now that we have a better foundation of what the budget is all about and the importance of creating one in the first place, as mentioned, the budget will be your business plan for the year. So let's talk about some of the key components that are gonna be comprised as you build your company-wide budget. So as you can see here, we have our sales, our costs of goods sold, the overhead, and the net profit. So first we start with our sales. So this is where you're gonna forecast all your sales goals for the upcoming year. So that way you can determine how much revenue you're gonna be generating for business. At the same time, you wanna then determine what are your costs of goods sold. So these are taken into account, all of the costs related to your jobs for the upcoming year. So any costs directly related to the estimates you're gonna be giving to your customers throughout the year, so that way you can cover all of those costs when building out those estimates. And then as mentioned, we have something called the overhead. And this is referring to your overhead expenses for any costs related that are not going to be related to the jobs, but you still wanna be able to recover them through our estimates. So these may be things like bank charges, uniforms, software, office rent, and so on. Anything really to keep your doors and business open. And finally, we have the net profit. So this is our key goal, key objective. Once you've determined your sales, you've identified your costs of goods sold, as well as the overhead contribution, we want to then determine how much net profit will we have at the end of the year. So this is kind of that entire life cycle or journey I'm going to be taking you through today's uh, session when we talk about the first part, which is your company-wide budget. All right, so to begin with, I wanna go ahead and take you through the first area of uh, items that I wanna consider when it comes to building out the budget for your company. So to get started, once you're logged into OMN, you'll be landing on the main dashboard. So as you can see, based on the permissions that you have set up by a business owner of your company, you'll be able to go ahead into the budget tool and this is where we're going to be able to see all of the budgets that have been created and whether or not they're going to be considered operational or an express budget. So yes, we have two different types. We have something called operational, which takes about roughly eight hours to build out. And then we have express, which takes about five minutes. So today we're going to be focusing on the fully wide company wide operational budget for this year. I'm going to explain each of the different tabs and how you would want to fill in each section based on numbers that are gonna reflect your own company. Now, before we kind of dive right into the budget side of things and pull up that budget and show you how uh, it kind of starts with, I do wanna be very, very clear on some of the different accesses available uh, based on the um, packages that your company is on with the LMN subscription. So specifically, if you are on the starter plan or basically the starter uh, subscription, you have access to one budget only. So it, there is a limit to one active budget for your company. And when it comes to pricing, overhead and net profit calculations, it's gonna be a manual adjustment. So just keep that in mind, it is very limited for that starter package. However, if you have the professional or enterprise subscription level with LMN, you do have access to unlimited budgets, including the ability to uh, work through something called divisional budgets, which I'll highlight in a little bit. And there's automatic updates for overhead recovery, net profit, and so on. So it's gonna be a, a lot more automated for you, a lot of enhancement and features that you're gonna deal with when you're on the professional or enterprise web. So just keep that in mind, uh, depending on which package uh, you have access to, if you're on the starter, or if you're looking to upgrade and have the ability to have multiple or unlimited budgets, you would want to look at the professional or enterprise. Can I just get a quick thumbs up? We're clear on that so far before we get started here. Okay, perfect. 
And again, as always, any questions throughout, definitely hit up the chat for Q&A. More than happy to go through things with you. Now, to begin with here, as a starting point, if it's your first time creating a budget, again, you may have some samples within your LMN account and you'll be able to edit those as needed. Now, if you wanted to start a brand new budget from scratch, you can always go to the new and then enter in the budget details. And this is where you can choose that budget style, okay? Now, specifically for today, as mentioned, we're gonna be referencing our 2024 fiscal budget. Here's the company name, the style, the status, the owner, when it was created and last edited, and then the total sales forecast. So once I open a budget, this is gonna be the first main section I'm gonna be taken through, which is kind of a snapshot of all the key information in this budget at this very moment in time. So if you, regardless of uh, which subscription on, you'll have uh, that one specific budget that's gonna be your main company-wide budget. So this will be that go-to screen. Now, if you wanted to make any changes and maybe take this as like a sample and then make an edit, maybe uh, your company works through a divisional budget structure. So remember with professional enterprise subscription, you do have access to implementing that. So maybe you want one specific budget for your install division, another one for your maintenance division or whatever the case might be. You can always reference that copy function and then you'll be able to go ahead and rename what that copy of that budget will be. So just a heads up your reference, okay? Now getting started here, as you can see, especially for the owners or accountants joining me on today's call, this is a snapshot of all the key information such as what you're expecting to bring in. So there's that sales goal in our case, 2.8 million. Then we have the profit goal. So how much we expect to make and what each estimate profit margin or calculated net profit margin will be on every single estimate we send out the door to make sure that we stay profitable. At the same time, we can then go ahead and see that we have our budget history. So this is gonna give us information who created the budget when it was created, when it was last updated, and who last updated. And then the status section will show whether or not it's active or inactive. Um, once you create your own budget, you want to make sure that you activate that. So that's good to go for default for your estimates going forward. Because again, the estimates will lean on that budget in order to be able to make sure that you're in line with exactly what you're tracking. And then we have the budget properties. So basically the name, company name, budget year. And then the work breakdown structure. This is very, very important when you begin building out your budget for your company. It's gonna help to provide with comparison details to indicate industry average calculations. So in other words, those fields cannot be customized as they do link to industry average numbers. But again, you want to be as specific as possible based on the type of work your company focuses on and break down your percentages accordingly for each category. So in my case, it looks like we're quite design build and install heavy because we have a majority of the sales that are going to be broken down into that division. Okay, so that's basically the first main uh, section of your budget. Once you have that all good to go you'll be able to go through the next uh, parts of it, but want to make sure you get that quick little snapshot before I take you through each and every single component of the budget. So just a reminder for you all, here are some of those best practices. We highly recommend you start with the company-wide budget. This should include all of your division sales, costs of goods sold, and overhead expenses. So everything within that one budget. Once you have that master budget, if you want to create a divisional budget, again, reminder, if you're on the professional or enterprise subscription, we have unlimited budgets, you can always make this much easier by using that copy function and then manipulate the company-wide budget accordingly. And finally, remember to review and update your budget annually. Now, keep in mind that you can go anytime throughout the year to make any changes to your budget, but as a best practice, at least annually because your sales, your cost of goods sold, and overhead expenses will change yearly. So we really want to make sure you're creating estimates that reflect those changes, okay? Just to make things nice and accurate. 
Now, a quick little hint for you all. If this is your first time creating a budget, remember to use that sample in your LMN account, and then you'll be able to make any changes as needed. All right, so the first element that we're gonna go ahead and consider is by going ahead and focusing on our sales budget as the beginning uh, stage of the key component within our budget tool. So when it comes to the sales budget, this is where you're gonna outline and forecast all your sales for the year. So it will help you to determine how much revenue you're gonna be bringing in and how much you need to recover all of your costs and expenses. So let's dive in uh, right into the sales budget. And as you can see on the left side menu, we have a quick little indicator of every section in terms of what we're forecasting and our percentages. So that way it's a quick little glance for you. So if I go into my sales, pretty straightforward here, we're gonna start by entering in all of the amounts for our company's divisions and then we'll kind of come back to the top row and review those numbers as well. So for each division, you can see here, I have like landscape install, maintenance, snow and ice and irrigation. We are entering in the actuals from the previous budget year and then our forecast for the current budget year. By that, we'll then be given the percentage of difference between both. And then if you wanna add any additional comments, you can go so and add them right over here. Now, quick reminder, if you are brand new to budgeting or if this is a new company, don't worry about filling in that previous dollar amount because next year you'll be in a better position to enter in the numbers. Now, once you've identified all your divisions and sales, that will then give you the total sales forecast, which you can see right at the top here, which is the revenue amount that you're expecting to bring in for your business. If we take a look at the first row here at the top, we can see a little bit of a bar graph that will show our division sales forecast or where majority of our sales and revenue is going. And as identified earlier, I told you that we're landscape install heavy, you can see majority of sales for that division. We also can then see that previous first forecast and then the change over previous. So what this basically is showing us is if our sales forecast is going up or down from our previous year's actions. So basically this is in terms of growth. So if our target of 2.8 million was met, our company will grow by 41.2% versus last year. Finally, if you wanna add in a new division, simply click on add new, and then you'll be able to go ahead and add in that new line. Okay, but that is basically your sales budget. So let's talk about some of the best practices here. Number one, be realistic. We don't want you to overestimate or underestimate your sales goals because if you're overestimating, you might be pricing the work to your customers too high and risk losing out on jobs. But if you underestimate, you won't be able to recover all of your cost or make a profit. So that's why it's super important to be realistic. Also set up your sales goals based on divisions. So most landscape companies have between one to five divisions. So we always recommend you have one line item per division. This way you can really get a clear understanding of the changes in your divisions from year to year. Don't forget to also include your cash sales. So treat these like any other forecasted jobs, even if it is a small amount, because at the end of the day, all jobs come with a cost, even if they're cash jobs. So you wanna be able to recover those costs accurately so you're not losing money when creating your estimates. And this is another reminder why the estimates are based on your budget. So important to be as accurate as possible. And finally, don't stress. Nothing is set in stone. As mentioned, you can always come back throughout the budget, in this case for your sales forecast, adjust those goals after you've completed your budget. And again, you can easily adjust these things throughout the year. Again, we're just trying to make things nice and accurate and efficient as possible. Okay, so that is basically the sales budget. 
Now we're gonna move into the field labor budget. So with this, we're gonna now identify or forecast all of our labor costs for the year. So this will basically include our employee wages, bonuses we foresee giving our employees, along with any potential overtime. So in other words, this is that first key pillar or component of the costs of goods sold. So we've identified our sales, but how much do we expect spent related to those costs? So same idea, we're gonna go back into the budget. This time we'll go to our field labor. And this is where we could see basically the way this is sorted out is broken down by our hourly field staff and our salaried field staff. So automatically you can tell here that this section is dedicated to those employees who are solely spent time in the field. So on the hourly field staff, we're identifying all employees that are paid hourly and work in the field. You can see here, we're not entering in the exact name of the employees. We're keeping it very higher level based on the type of role. So we have, for example, an install crew lead. We have three of them. The hours per year are identified, the overtime hours, the average wage, and the bonus. Based on all that information, we know we have an automatic calculation of 129,000, and that's the amount we need to set aside in order to pay out my waivers. Now, if somehow you made an error, and let's just say that this employee was actually spending time in the office, those types of employees will be broken down within the overhead, and you can always click on the action to easily move it forward. So that way we don't have any duplicate entries, okay? Now with the salaried field staff, same exact idea, but this time we're looking at yearly hours and annual salary, right? No hourly, no hourly information on this screen. So for example, we can see all of our office space employees. So we, for example, uh, uh, sorry. So for the salaried field staff, uh, we're gonna make sure that again, if there's a portion of time in the field and in the office, so let's just say that we have our project manager where 50% of our time is in the field, but the remaining is going to be in the office. We'll come back to the overhead to see where that remaining 50% is. But here we could have our fur tech, field supervisor, lead head, project manager. You could see the annual hours, annual salary, and the bonus. Okay. And what the automatic calculation is for our annual wages. Does that make sense to everyone when it comes to breaking down any of the times or maybe you have some business owners on today's call where you have a portion of your time in the field and a portion of your time in the office. So that way we split that salary accordingly between here and the overhead. Just wanna make sure that is crystal clear before we kind of proceed. Okay, perfect. And trust me, I'm gonna refer back to this uh, when we get into the overhead section, okay? So now based on everything that has been entered, we can take a look at our field labor summary. We have our total hours that are identified. We have our total wages, but you're also noticing we have something called the labor burden and the field labor ratio. Well, how does that actually come into effect and how can we analyze these numbers that are being popular? Well, for just a quick moment, I wanna go ahead and uh, bring you into a uh, quick reminder before we get into those formulas and specifically, as mentioned, when it comes to best practices for entering in your labor cost, enter in your field staff only. We wanna keep it based on, on that. And then the office employees will be listed within the overhead section. Let's also make sure our forecasted field labor lines up with our sales forecast. So if your sales is going up, your field labor costs will also go up. And then make sure you also include raises in your forecasted field labor costs as well, because your estimates are based on your budget. And if you have employees that are not full-time and they only work as temporary labor, you still wanna go ahead and uh, forecast them within this section so that we can recover these costs through our estimates. Okay, and when forecasting these field labor wages, make sure to do by staff role. So for example, your crew lead, general laborers, irrigation specialist, and so on, as opposed to putting a specific name on the forecast. So as mentioned, there are some additional items now that we kind of have these best practices in mind. We have the field labor burden. 
So this is specifically going to be the cost of expenses over and above your field labor wages. Remember, we had those total wages calculated out. So basically, it's going to recover items such as like payroll tax, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, paid sick and vacation time as a percentage of your field labor budget. So this is specifically what that uh, you, you see how I got that 18% in my budget. So basically, that is what the field labor burden is referring to. How can you calculate this? You'll take the cost of the labor burden and divide that by your total field labor wages. This will then give you that percentage. Now, if you wanna save yourself time, especially if you're just starting out, you're not sure on what those costs are gonna be, you can use an industry average of 20%. We also have the field labor ratio. This will automatically be calculated once all the other figures have been entered. So this ratio will then tell us what percentage of our sales is being spent on field labor and give us a benchmark so we can compare our labor percentage to similar companies in the industry. Now, if you wanna calculate this, simply divide your field labor wages by your total forecasted sales. This is why we wanna make sure that both our sales budget and our field labor costs are all identified in advance so we can automatically determine these ratios. Now, again, we do have some industry averages uh, to kind of keep in mind. So typically with design bill work, uh, close to about 20 or 25%. Maintenance and snow, close to about 40%. Now, if you do a mixture of both, typically between 20 to 40% relatively. And here is an example on uh, my screen. As you can see here, we have a ratio of 22.5 versus our industry average of 22%. <clears throat> and our ratio is in green, meaning it's in line or the more sense we're making with our numbers. So now we can officially go back within our budget and take a look at what we have here. So as you can see, we have our 18%. We have our overtime multiplier as well. So this is the rate at which you pay your employees overtime. And then if we go ahead to the field labor ratio, now <clears throat> ours is basically showing us that we have 31.9% in terms of it in, uh, projected forecasted sales on field labor costs versus our industry average of spend, which is 25.9. So we're in red. We're going to take a look later in our budget analysis to see where we can get this more into like that green status. But essentially, that is what the labor burden and your field labor is basically uh, telling you in terms of this ratio, as you can see. Okay, we clear on those two aspects. You're going to kind of see the next components into how the ratios are determined, but just wanted to make sure that is uh, well aware in advance. Uh, yeah, so specifically, uh, question gang here in terms of that field uh, labor ratio. So I'm just going to bring you back for a quick moment just to give you kind of uh, how that is uh, being uh, uh, determined. So basically, that industry average of spend based on the actual cost of goods sold. So in this case, we had basically, if you see our 22%, our 22.5% is basically calculated by taking your entire field labor wages and dividing that by your total forecasted sales. So this is gonna be automatically entered. It's not like a manual entry that you're gonna be doing uh, through this part of the budget. Uh, does that make sense for your question there? Just wanted to make sure we're clear there. No problem at all. And uh, hopefully going back to that quick little visual uh, helped you out as well. No worries. Okay, perfect. So based on that, the next part that we want to start uh, covering off is going to be our equipment budget. Okay, so now that we've identified one of the costs of goods sold, which is our labor cost, the next item we want to consider is going to be our equipment. So this is where you outline all the equipment and vehicles that are going to be strictly used in the field. So we're going to determine how much we're spending on equipment in relation to your sales goals, so you have a proper equipment plan for the year. So some of the common questions that you're gonna ask yourself every now and then 
will include what equipment do we need in relation to the work we are doing? Can we afford more equipment? Do we have too much equipment? So you'll see by having an equipment budget put in place, this will help you to answer these questions and really at the end of the day, make more informed decisions because you're gonna see how uh, based on the data you're inputting and the numbers that LMN is breaking down for you, how accurate you'll be by having a foundation well built in advance when it comes to your equipment plan for the year. So when it comes to the equipment, a little bit different from what we are just learning in the field labor cost, but the equipment will be classified under four different options. We have owned, leased, group, and custom. So think of these as like four different categories for which you're gonna enter in your equipment based on. So first is owned. So this is the type where you outright own that equipment, or if you're financing it, you're gonna be paying monthly payments, but at the very end, you're gonna own it. For any leased equipment, this is where you make monthly lease payments, where in this case, you're gonna be returning that piece of equipment at the end of the lease. Whereas if you're to finance it, you own it outright at the end. Then we have group. So for any time you have the, uh, the need to group similar or smaller pieces of equipment together. So a common example would be like an equipment trailer where you take a bunch of smaller tools on, on that uh, piece of equipment all the time. You can basically store those equipment trailers under the group category. And finally, we have custom. So if you have any long-term seasonal rentals, maybe an excavator or whatever the case might be for, let's say for pool excavations for a few months or whatever the case, this is where you can strictly go ahead and use a custom option and directly enter the cost of that rental. So let's put this into action. And we're gonna see some examples uh, within the budget. So I'll go back into my budget and let's pull up the equipment. And as you can see, I have quite a few different equipments added. We can see the name of the equipment, the quantity, and what is that class going to be in addition to any key description. So let's go ahead through four examples based on those ownership classes. So starting with the first one, we're gonna choose this crew truck three quarter ton. We have four of them, and this is gonna be under the owned option. Now within that, you will also notice that we have this cost calculator breakdown. So this is gonna help you to be even more accurate with your equipment costs. Because it's owned, the first thing we need to enter in is what is that replacement value of the equipment? Do we have any additional purchase fees, taxes, or admin costs? The total years I expect to own and use it. What is the estimated value at the end of those seven years? And the number of months per year I plan to use. Now, if again, your company is on the professional or enterprise subscription, you're looking to upgrade. This is where when you utilize that divisional budget structure, you can also identify the number of months that equipment works in that particular division. And then we have the inflation and interest rate. The interest inflation over the life of the equipment will be automatically calculated. And finally, we have the monthly return on investment and the annual return on investment. So we could see that we come to a total of 5,635.35 cents. Well, again, to recover all the costs associated with this piece of equipment, we still need to multiply that by four because we have four of these crew trucks that are three quarter tight. So we know now out of that uh, sales goal uh, that we had earlier that we're expecting to bring in, we need to basically set aside 22,541.39 cents to accommodate this crew truck. Now, quick little note for you here when you're entering in equipment that is owned. Do we have any uh, anyone who wants to quick show of hands? How many of you have some equipment that is already fully paid for from time to time? Okay, so very, very important to note that if you have equipment that is fully paid for, it needs to also be included in your budget. 
because if that equipment breaks down or cannot be repaired, you have the ability to add in that replacement value in the budget to cover the possibility of a new one that can be purchased. So we had quite a few of you jumping in. Does that make sense? Just want to make sure you're clear on that as well for any fully paid for equipment. Awesome. So that is basically the owned option. Now let's talk a little bit more about the leased. And for leased, I'm gonna go ahead and choose my <clears throat> plow and salter. So we only have one of them. Again, we have a calculator option. And because it's leased, in this case, we're entering in what is the monthly payment, how many payments we plan to make per year, and the rest will remain the same. So as you can see, for this equipment item, we have a total of 9,300, and that is the amount that we need to set aside out of our entire sales forecast <clears throat> to recover for this piece of equipment. Okay, so pretty straightforward for lease. Finally, we have the group and custom. So for group, let's say we choose one of our trailers. We have this maintenance trailer. Within that calculator, the difference is, instead of just plugging in a direct amount, simply because we have that trailer here, we're gonna enter in all of those smaller pieces of equipment. In addition to the trailer purchase price, we're gonna enter in the resale value for each of these different items. So like our push mower, walk behind, backpack floors, and gas line trimmers. And we'll then have our total that we need to set aside to recover this piece of equipment. And finally, we have custom. So I have an example here of an excavator rental. So for the long-term seasonal rental of three months for pool excavations, instead of adding in any additional details, this is the only one out of the four ownership classes <clears throat> for which there is no cost calculated. Simply directly enter in what is that cost of the rental, and that is it. <clears throat> So hopefully by now you're able to see quite a few of different uh, differences and how these can be distinguished accordingly. But you may be also thinking, why do we need to enter in all of this grand amount of detail into our equipment budget? Well, based on all the numbers that we've entered in, LMN will then tell us at the top the following. So the equipment expenses are gonna be this specific amount. So that's a total for this year out of our entire sales to set aside. But how can LMN make you more profitable and more efficient? Well, we need to also take into consideration our general expenses. So the fuel repairs and insurance, because these are still costs associated when it comes to operating and using these pieces of equipment. <clears throat> On top of that, you may wanna send one of your estimators to another state for a project in which they're not gonna be using a personal car. Maybe you want to rent it. So instead of adding in like a long-term seasonal rental, maybe there's some smaller type of projects that need to be uh, uh, utilizing uh, some, some equipment for a smaller, shorter period of time. We can also enter in those equipment rental costs right over here. Uh, let me see here. I think I'm getting in a question. Is forecast fuel conserved for of the equipment? Yes, so this is a great question. So specifically, this forecast fuel repairs and insurance is gonna be related to the all of the equipment that is gonna be forecasted here, specifically used in the field. So you'll wanna make sure you have that total amount for each of those. Because again, those are still general expenses with costs associated with them. So the better and more you forecast them now, the greater your chance of being able to recover those costs as well. Let me know if you needed some additional clarification on that, or hopefully those two insights uh, helped you out there. Okay, looks like we're good to go. If any other question on that, uh, definitely let me know, no worries. So based on adding in now our general expenses and our equipment rentals, you could see the difference. You thought your cost was gonna be this amount, but now we've considered both of these additional items and this will bump up our cost to 264,000. And that is now 
the amount we need to set aside out of our sales to make sure we're recovering our equipment budget. So have you all been able to now see that in both the field labor and equipment budget, it's not the cost I thought of as a landscaper, but there's a lot of smaller things to make note of. And this is why it's super important to have that budget put in place. So that way you're not gonna be encountering those costs from your own pocket. Instead, you'll be able to recover those through your estimates at the end of the day. Okay, perfect. Finally, we can take a look at our equipment ratio. So we could see here that we have a projected forecasted sales of equipment of 9.3 versus our industry average of spend, which is 13.3%. Again, we'll need to do a little bit of analysis to see where we can get this more in line for industry average. Okay, so that's basically your equipment. So here's a reminder on some of those best practices. So remember, only entering equipment that you're specifically using out in the field. Also include your own equipment pieces. So we had quite a few of you jumping in there earlier. Great, great to see this is something uh, very common and well known. So essentially, even if you have fully paid for equipment, still go ahead and plug those into your budget here because there's still a cost uh, cost associated with using those equipment. So you wanna be able to recover those through your estimates, okay? Also, you can group your equipment by type. So maybe you have five new tractors, you can put those in as one line item. And also remember those general expenses, such as the fuel repairs and insurance. At the end of the day, those are also costs that need to be recovered. So the better we forecast them now, the greater the chance we have the cash flow available to pay for it when the time comes. And lastly, your depreciation is included in the equipment cost calculator. So LMN will take into consideration the time you're planning on owning the equipment and factor in that residual value. Next up, we have our material budget. So this is where we're gonna include all of our job material expenses, and it will help us to determine what materials we need for the jobs or forecasting, and give us a clear idea on what material cost will be for the year. So time to go ahead and take a look at the material. Uh, before that, I do have another question coming in. If we have uh, paid equipment, but it's not actively being used, Vehicle is registered under business, so it's a business added asset. Should we exclude it? So in the case where there's some equipment that maybe it's like the owner's truck or it's a vehicle based for like office use personally, I'm going to actually show you within the overhead equipment section where you can store that. So that way you're distinguishing between what's used in the field and what is not specifically used in the field. You are very welcome. I appreciate that question. So let's go ahead into the material side of things. All right, so taking a look at the material budget, automatically you're gonna see that this looks very similar to like when we are actually forecasting our sales based on the different types of divisions. So essentially the same exact type of idea, Basically, you'll plug in your material expenses based on each division. So we have our install, maintenance, snow and ice, and irrigation. In addition, you can add one for the disposal or job site waste as well. From here, you're gonna do the same thing. Enter in the previous budget actuals from our previous budget year. Forecast for the current year. The difference will be automatically calculated for you. And then at the very top, we can see our previous versus our current. And this is the amount that we need to set aside to recover our material budget. Okay. Based on the numbers that you are forecasting here, it's also very important to note whether or not you have factored in material tax for each of these different divisions. If you have already factored in that uh, tax into these divisions over here, you can leave this at zero. But if you have not applied it, you wanna go ahead and plug in what that material tax is going to be. Again, just makes things nice and accurate. Finally, we'll then see our projected forecast sales of material costs. 
versus our industry average of spend. That is pretty much it that you need to know on the material side. Just wanna make sure that you have it nicely organized based on the type of work, as opposed to listing every single material in this section. It's not what we wanna do. We wanna keep it very higher level. And this will go ahead and tie in very nicely to when I talk about these best practices. So remember, only in, enter in the materials used in the field. So any materials used when building out your estimates. You want to forecast all your material costs. So make sure it's uh, the, this part of the budget is uh, focused on your forecasted material sales and not necessarily on what you spent last year, right? Because things will change from year to year. Also, you can group your materials by division. So maybe you have install, maintenance, and snow divisions. We just want to get a grand total dollar amount for your material expenses. And finally, don't forget your job disposal fees. So if you charge your customer a disposal fee on their estimates, make sure including that in the material budget. So that way that's accounted for in advance. And then we have our subcontractor budget. Quick show of hands, how many of you have a variety of subcontractors for various types of projects within uh, your company, whether it be with design builds or the maintenance side of the business? Okay, and I'm sure it does vary from uh, season to season, right? May have some, some different subs this year versus next season and so on. So this is gonna be the part of the budget where you include all of the costs related specifically to your subcontractors. So that way, when you're building an estimate in LMN, you can choose which subcontractors are needed for certain projects and add a markup to their work. At the same time, it will help you to plan and forecast what your sub costs will be like for the upcoming year. So this is also a pretty straightforward section. There's a uh, one specific difference you're going to catch here, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, break this down for you. So if we go into subcontracting, immediately we could see where or what subcontractor expenses I currently have for my company. So as you can see, we have some irrigation subs, carpentry, deck, woodwork subs, and concrete. Very, very key to make note of when you're adding in the subcontractor, we're grouping them based on the type. So in other words, I'm not entering in the subcontractor name or company name, simply just based on the type of work that's going to be associated with that subcontract. Uh, I have a question here, and it looks like this is actually going back to the material side, so not a problem. As for the materials going forward, as we adopt LMN, will we be able to efficiently track material costs um, per division? Currently, we don't have this detailed breakdown info, so we're approximating. Yes, so as you continue to onboard and adopt with the LMN software, you wanna make sure when you're working with onboarding that your, your uh, materials budget is broken down based on the division. And you're gonna see specifically when my colleague Chris takes over in the second app, where you can actually break down your specific materials so you can distinguish between what was forecasted in your material expense in the budget versus all of the different costs that are gonna be associated when it comes to breaking down your material items in the price list. And when it comes to estimating, you're then gonna be able to see exactly what budget is referring or reflected in your pricing at the end of the day. So you're gonna see this entire journey and flow as you go through the various trainings. Uh, hopefully that answered that question. Uh, let me know if there's any additional insight you require there. No worries at all. Okay. Loving the thinking, everyone. Thanks for uh, participating and uh, engaging with me. Really just helps things uh, make, make things uh, go nice and smoothly uh, as we're continuing to go through today's content. So appreciate all of that uh, feedback. Okay. Perfect. So basically, that is pretty much how you'll break down your subcontractor budget. You'll be able to see your previous forecast versus your current uh, for this year. Now, at the same time, as I mentioned, there is one key identifier here. When it comes to basically our field labor, equipment, and materials, 
we did see our projected forecasted sales for those costs, along with an industry average. Now, can anyone tell me, why do you think in the case of subcontractors, we only have that ratio here, but we don't have an industry average at this point? Not all companies using subcontractors. Exactly, it does vary from business to business. So it's not really something where we have an exact industry average number to populate. So just wanna make sure you're very clear of that as well, because that's the key difference between the other costs of goods sold that we've been breaking down, okay? And with that said, very briefly, there's only gonna be a couple of different best practices for the subcontractor budget. Number one, when you're forecasting these expenses, make sure you set that subcontractor budget on forecasted job sales and not lost year's expenses. Keep it nice and accurate for the upcoming year. And remember to enter these in based on the type of subcontractor. Keep it nice and higher level. We don't need to know that name of the individual sub or the company name, very similar to when we were entering in our field labor, we kept a very higher level based on the type of role or type of work. Now, super exciting, let's go through the overhead budget. As I told you, this is a very important section of your budget. You wanna pay close attention to this because trust me, Chris is gonna reflect upon this when it comes to the priceless tool later, but essentially the overhead budget will include all of your overhead expenses. So then when you're adding in an estimate, all indirect costs are recovered through a mark. So this budget will really help you to identify what your overhead costs are going to be like for the year. Now, the way that the overhead budget will be broken down is into three different sections. So when you go into the overhead, as you can see, we have our overhead expenses. We have our overhead wages, and we have our overhead equipment. At the end of the day, all three of these are going to be things that we need to recover at the end of the day. So we want to keep it nice and established for it. So starting with the overhead expenses, as you can see, I have quite a few different overhead expenses entered. Essentially, this is going to be anything that is not billed to your customers because it's a cost related to a job site. So in other words, things like... Uh, Marketing, finance, admin, like office supplies, business development, professional, facilities, there's the rent we talked about, uh, tax, all of those information will be uh, identified, even just uh, like your software, such as your LMN subscription, or even if you're using QuickBooks, whatever the case might be, anything to keep your doors open for business, these are going to be those overhead related expenses, something that is not related to the customer's job set. Now, by chance, if there are some items, let's say it's a material that was added <clears throat> and it's actually going to be referenced in the material budget, you can always use the action option to go and move it to the material budget as well. But don't think I need to get into too much detail on every single overhead expense I got. Hopefully you got the idea. Give me a quick thumbs up if you're clear on what overhead expenses uh, may be applicable for your company. Again, you may still be working through this, but hope you get the general idea for it. Perfect. Uh, let me just see, I think, uh, okay, I think someone just gave me a thumbs up, no worries. All right, so going into the overhead wages, the difference here, unlike what we are doing in the field labor budget, where we had specifically any employees where time was spent in the field, in the overhead wages, as mentioned, this will be for any of the salaries that are gonna be referring to office staff, the owner's salary, project manager, and things of that sort of nature. So here we can see we have an office manager where all of this information was broken down. We also have the owner's wage, and there's that project manager. Remember 50% of their time was spent in the field and that was within the field labor costs. Now we have identified the remaining, which is the 50% in the office, and their salary has been broken down here. That way we are not duplicating and we're being very nice and accurate when we're building out our budget. 
So for any of the owners on today's call, if you spend a portion of your time in the field and in the office, make sure you do so applicably. So that way everything will be accurate across the board. Good on that? Okay, perfect. Finally, the overhead equipment. So this is where things, just like we added in the equipment used in the field, we identified those forecast fuel repairs and insurance. You still wanna account for that for any of the overhead equipment that you're at. So the fuel costs, repairs and maintenance, the owner's truck, um, maybe uh, the shop materials and consumables, anything that is related to equipment that is not used in the field will be entered just in here, the same way you are using equipment classes in the equipment budget. In this case, we just have it listed as custom, but you can always go and choose any of those options and enter that in. So going back to the question I got earlier in terms of the distinguishing between the equipment in the field and the office, is this making clear sense now between what the equipment budget is for versus where you would store overhead equipment and those fuel repairs and insurance? Want to make sure I know I got a question asked by someone there. Just want to make sure that is uh, awesome. Okay, appreciate you uh, jumping in there. Perfect. So with that said, those are pretty much all of the three items I wanted to cover on the overhead. As mentioned, I wanted to take my sweet time explaining this to make sure you're all in line with the content uh, to be added within this section. Based on those uh, numbers, uh, let me see here. Okay, another question coming in here. Uh, for overhead wages, is there a way to calculate the per hour? Or is it expected to be salary calculated? So it really depends on the type of role, but specifically you're gonna forecast based on that salary breakdown. So if a portion is spent in the field and a portion is spent in the office, it's not like a, a sort of um, automated calculation. You would basically focus on like those salary and that that we have broken down here, or if it's an hourly employee, whichever the case might be. It's just gonna be another area for any of the employees not spending time in the field. Does that make sense? Yeah, no worries at all. Okay, perfect. And remember actually on that note, when it comes to overhead and overhead recovery and net profit, Remember specifically, if you're on the starter plan with LMN, there is some manual adjustments and calculations required. But if it's going to be, if you're on professional enterprise, there is some automation. I'm gonna to talk to you about that when we get into overhead recovery, but stay tuned for that. Just wanted to give you a heads up in advance, okay? All right, so based on this breakdown, from each of the three options that we've identified, we have our total overhead expenses, we have our overhead wages, and we have our overhead equipment. So that is automatically determined. You don't need to go ahead and manually uh, keep that in mind, okay? It's automated by the system. Finally, we have our overhead ratio, so we can see what ours is versus what is the industry average of spend, and then we can see where we're in line or the more sense we're making at the end of the day. <clears throat> So let me give you a reminder on uh, some of these best practices here. So when it comes to uh, going ahead and building out your overhead budget, remember to forecast your expenses. So if you're going to be doing an office renovation, make sure you include that as an added expense within your overhead. If you have any shop or office vehicles or the owner's truck, you wanna make sure that you plug in the same way you're doing in the equipment budget within the overhead equipment section. So that way you can recover those costs at the end of the day. And again, same thing applies to those general expenses such as the fuel repairs and insurance. And yes, even the owner needs to get paid. So if the owner of a company works in the office, make sure to allocate a portion of their salary in the overhead budget. And if they also work in the field, you would account for the remaining portion of the salary within the field labor budget. All right, so let's talk about overhead recovery. So this is basically gonna provide you a markup percentage to apply to all of your estimates to ensure you're recovering overhead expenses throughout the year on every job that you are delivering. So every time that labor 
equipment, materials, or subcontractor pricing is added to an estimate, an overhead markup percentage will be applied and you'll be charged a price that recovers all of your overhead expenses. So with that being said, there are three different overhead recovery methods. Now to explain this in a little bit more detail, I wanna bring it up right on your end. So let's see, can I just get confirmation that uh, one second. Can you all see that clearly on your end with the three different types? Okay, and let me see, I see another point coming in. Um, Sorry for a back and forth, not a problem at all. I uh, appreciate the questions as always. Uh, for expenses, is it okay to just extract? Um, so based on what you have in your QuickBooks profit and loss categories or the expenses there, you would be able to pull in those if you have like that list. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be like an automatic sync into Element, but you can definitely keep track of those if those are related to your overhead expenses. Just wanna make sure you're nice in line with that information and duplicates, exactly. You wanna make sure that you're not duplicating those entries. Yeah, no worries at all. Okay, so as you can see on my screen, we have three different overhead recovery methods. We have the single overhead recovery method, so SOARS for short. So essentially this is gonna be the method where you basically apply a single markup to all estimated items to recover your overhead. Common example is with the retail garden center where every item for sale there will be marked up the same way or by the same percentage throughout the store to recover your overhead expenses. The second is field labor hour method. So this applies an hourly dollar amount to your labor hours. So in the industry, any companies that are strictly maintenance and labor intensive will tend to choose this method because you're not pricing jobs that are heavy on equipment, materials, and subs. Rather, you only want to recover overhead through labor. So that's going to be FOH or field labor hour method. Finally, the most recommended one is going to be MORS or multiple overhead recovery method. So specifically, this will allow you to dictate markups across your labor, material, equipment, and subs. So very common in industry if your company does a mixture of work such as maintenance, install, and stuff. Okay, so those are basically the three different types that I wanted to uh, quickly identify when it comes to the overhead uh, recovery section. And again, as a reminder, you do uh, have automatic updates for overhead recovery in the case that your company is on professional or enterprise. Just another quick reminder uh, as we're kind of going through all of these different uh, key elements when it comes to the overhead recovery. Any questions on those three different methods before I bring you into the software and see our numbers come into effect? Or are we clear on that so far? Okay, looks like we're good to go. Let me see. Uh, for 70% maintenance. Um, so specifically, if you want to only recover through the labor, and again, you are strictly maintenance only, that may be a more applicable uh, solution. But if you do a mixture of work, like you're saying here, we do maintenance, uh, landscaping, and irrigation, and you do a mixture of a different batch of work, it may be more so best to go through MORS. Now, again, depending on the recommendations, I'm going to kind of lead to this at the end, but you want to work with the onboarding team to see exactly based on your business profile, which one's going to be the most ideal option. But based on what you're telling me, if it's a mixture of that, probably MORS would be more relevant in that case. And you're going to see some best practices why I recommend the MORS option as well. No problem. All right. So with that said, because... Quite a few of you are already excited on that. So I'm gonna bring you right into the software again. And let me just show you how this works. So essentially, if I go to my overhead recovery, if I were to go ahead and activate the single overhead recovery factor for my own company, I know that my overhead expenses um, in this case are gonna be this amount. 
Now I'm going to divide my total job related costs. So all of my costs of goods sold, and that will work out to be 2.2 million or basically 25.2%, which is a percentage applied to every line item on the proposal for my overhead expenses. Now, if I want to go through for a question here, I had FOH, field labor hour. Basically, in order to achieve 570,000 in terms of my forecast overhead expenses, out of this amount of forecasted labor hours, I basically need to add in $11.95 per hour to every uh, single man hour cost to ensure that I'm recovering all of my overhead expenses. So pretty straightforward, if you're ground maintenance or maintenance only and you only want to recover through labor, this will be the ideal solution for you. Finally, if you activate the most recommended option, which is Morse, you can dictate the markups across each of the estimated line item types. And based on that, you'll know exactly how much you can recover for each. So this is where you have a little bit more flexibility at the end of the day in terms of what you want to recover. Is that making a little bit more sense in terms of uh, where you have that? Hopefully that is clear. But again, any additional recommendations or insights, definitely bring it up in your next onboarding meeting. Okay. So based on that, we have MARS activated. And speaking of that, I'm going to just talk to you about some of the best practices. So basically, if you do a mixture of work, Moore's is the recommended option. It really helps you to be more competitive with your pricing and help you win the type of work you want to do since you can adjust the markups on your estimates. Now, some of the industry averages to keep in mind. Because subs manage themselves, we only apply an overhead markup of 5%. But with materials, there is some slight management involved. So there's a higher markup at 10%. Now with equipment, definitely needs to be managed, organize who's taking what equipment to site or if it needs repairs. So we have a higher markup at 25%. The majority will then go to your labor because it's the hardest to manage and we always need labor to complete our jobs. Now again, depending on the type of work you do, you'll wanna choose the overhead recovery method that will best suit your company. Finally, time now to take a look at the profit and loss section of the budget. So this will show us our company's revenues and expenses indicating how revenue will be transformed into net income. So what I want you to keep in mind here, and I'm gonna just bring this up on my screen again, is the two different formulas we're gonna talk about. One is gross profit and the second is net profit. So your gross profit will be determined once you take your entire sales revenue and you subtract all of your costs of goods sold. Once you get that total amount for your gross profit, you then want to consider those overhead contributions. So the overhead expenses, wages, and overhead equipment. So you'll take your gross profit, you'll subtract your overhead, and that will then land on your net profit. Ultimately, leading to your calculated net profit margin, or what that percentage will be on every estimate that you send out the door. So let's take a look now at how this works. Okay, so as you can see on my screen, if I go to the profit and loss summary, you can take a look and see exactly we've identified all of our sales. So we have our total income. So basically that reaches 2.8 million. Now in the day to day while out in the field earning the business, I need to spend 2.2 million or basically 79% of my sales. But based on that information, in order to calculate the gross profit, we need to take basically our total sales, subtract our cost of goods sold, and this will lead us to 600,000 or 21%, which is our gross profit. Don't forget, this is where now the importance of the overhead comes into play. Once we take that gross profit amount, we subtract our overhead expenses, which is 570,000, we will then land on our net income in terms of profit, which is 30,000 or 1.1%, 1 
which is the top figure that we have. And that will be our calculated net profit margin to make sure we're profitable at the end of the day. Now, if you're looking at this and you're like, hey, well, Jay, you know what? That's going to be very low as a profit margin to be on every estimate that we send out the door. Let's say maybe relatively we need to reach 10%. What is a quick way for us to adjust this on the fly, especially if our company is just starting out? Simply, we can go into our sales and we can add in a profit margin adjustment or enhancement line. And this will help us to add a little bit of a buffer. So based on that, now we have some more room to work with. So if I go to my budget info, we now are at 10%. And if I go to my profit and loss summary, we now have that 10%. So very important to keep in mind if your profit margin is too low, maybe your first time in business or creating a budget, you can always add in this item and then review your budget for accuracy. Next year, after having an entire year with LMN software and getting used to working with the budget, you'll have more accurate numbers to use and the need for that profit margin adjustment line will likely go away. Okay, so just want you to keep that in mind. Now, based on what you've analyzed from your profit and loss summary, if you have high field labor or equipment costs, you really want to improve on your efficiency, you want to increase your sales and materials, but hold on all of your other overhead costs. If your overhead expenses are too high, you want to do more work by increasing your sales, materials, and labor costs, but holding on your overhead costs. And if your profit is too close to your goal, simply charge a bit more. You can increase your sales on hold on all other related costs. So with that, based on your numbers, LMN suggested your profit margin percentage that will be used on your estimates. We also suggested your overhead recovery method. And then we'll be seeing our percentages automatically populated over into our price list in the next portion of today's training. So with that being said, if you have any additional questions, definitely hit up the chat or Q&A. More than happy to kind of go through that. While you're thinking and submitting those questions, just to do a quick little recap, we forecasted our sales. We've entered in the field labor, equipment, material, subs, and overhead costs. And the next thing to do is analyze the budget for profit and activate the budget for estimate. So with that being said, if I go back here into LMN for a moment, based on all the key information that we have identified, if I go to the budget analysis, this is where you have the ability to see all of the information, such as where is my revenue going, uh, the revenue per man hour calculation, the budget throughput, capacity and efficiency. And at the bottom, this is where that budget ratio analysis comes into mind when we are talking about those industry average uh, calculations and ratios. So it's kind of like an Einstein reality check where you can see all of the key information in terms of where you need to kind of consider uh, when you're going through this. So definitely something to keep in mind to understand where those recommendations are coming into effect. What I really want you to be able to understand here when it comes to the budget is on the whole, we want you to know when uh, you have everything completed, your numbers are put in place, understand your numbers, what do those numbers mean, and what actions can you make to ensure everything is making sense for you. Okay, and then of course, the final thing you wanna do is go to your budget info and make sure that the budget is activated so you can use that for estimating going forward. So with that being said, one quick favor to ask, uh, I don't see any additional questions that have come through, but I do have uh, some questions for you just to make sure you're, you're engaged on all the key content that I've covered with you here today. So you should be seeing a poll on your screen right about now. So we're gonna give you some time to complete that poll, work through some of the questions based on today's content. Just wanna make sure you're all engaged uh, so far. And at the same time, Highly encourage you all to go and take a five minutes break uh, before my colleague Chris jumps in here to cover the price list portion in the next stop of today's session. But for now, from my end, it was a pleasure speaking with you all this morning. Thank you so much for all of the key questions and participation throughout. Just help things to go nice and smoothly here. So big uh, thanks to you all for doing that. But for now, enjoy your well-deserved break. And I'm sure I'll be seeing you next time. Bye for now, everyone.
Hey everybody, welcome back. Hope you guys had a enough time to grab a coffee, stretch your legs, grab a glass of water, whatever you guys need to do. But more importantly, hopefully you guys didn't start looking at your phones and going through social media and getting stuck in that uh, horrible little social media rabbit hole. Because now we're going to be talking about the price list. And we're going to be look at learning about how you guys are going to be setting up your price list for your own company's accounts using the information or using what you've learned from Jay a little bit earlier with the price list. So first, I get a, let's get a good understanding as to what exactly is your price list. Well, your price list is another tool that's available to you in LMN and, of course, in your LMN account to provide you guys with consistent pricing when you are estimating. So what we want to do is we want to basically walk you through how you can set up labor pricing, pricing for the equipment that you're going to be using on a job site, the materials that you're going to be reselling to your uh, to your customers. If you guys are using any subcontractors, what you need to charge for your subcontractors. And we're also going to be looking at another category in your price list called the other. Now, I know it's pretty random or pretty vague, but what are the other terms or what are the other items? Well, these are going to be items that you are just going to be recovering your cost on. These will not have any overhead recovery added to them, but just want to make sure that you guys are entering in items that you do not need to recover overhead, but do need to recover your overall cost and, of course, add a profit margin. Now, why should you guys be setting up a price list in your element accounts? Well, again... The benefits for you guys, and pardon our spelling mistake, I just noticed this on our screen here. It's been a long time since I've done the price list session, so I just realized that benefits is actually spelt wrong. So it's B-E-N-E-F-I-T-S, not F-I. Anyway, let's, let's forget that. What are the benefits of you guys using the LMN price list? Well, let's take a look at what you guys learned about in your budgeting section. In the budgeting session held by Jay, we learned about cost, we learned about markups, and so on and so forth. So when you guys are putting together your price list in LMN, we are going to understand what the prime principal or initial job site cost is of that particular item, whether it be for uh, labor, equipment, materials, what have you. We're then also going to learn or we're also going to be adding or marking up that cost with our overhead recovery, right? So again, depending on what uh, method of overhead recovery you guys are using, whether it be Moore's, the field labor hour method, or the single overhead recovery method, it doesn't matter. But whatever option you guys have selected in your budgeting when you guys are put calculating out your price, in order for you to determine its break even, it's going to basically look at your basic cost plus your overhead recovery markup. Again, Moore's, FLH, or single overhead, it doesn't matter. That will then determine what your break even. So if you were to charge at that particular price, you're not losing any money, but you're not making any money either. You're just covering your costs. Where the next piece comes into play or the added or the final piece of the puzzle when it comes to your benefits is adding in that final net profit or calculated net profit margin that your budget spits out after you've entered all your numbers in. And that's going to determine what your final customer price is going to be. So to kind of give everybody just a you know, very, very brief overview of what we just talked about, Job site cost or item cost plus overhead recovery will provide you with a break-even number. Break-even number plus your overhead recovery markup will give you your customer price. So what this will basically provide you with is overall consistent pricing for anybody that's going to be using your LMN account for estimating. The price list, just so everybody is understood or understands, when you guys are allocating or adding new users to your customer, to your uh, LMN account, everybody may have access to estimating. And those who have access to estimating will have access to your price list. So you as the owner or office manager or division manager or whatever your role might be within the company, you want to ensure that everybody is using consistent pricing. Like if I were to set up a 
you know, a mowing service or a uh, deck install build or estimate, my labor pricing is going to be the same as if Jay was doing the exact same thing or the equipment that we're charging for could be the exactly the same and so on and so forth, right? It's going to be consistent. Now, we're also going to make sure that when you guys follow or use our priceless tool in LMN, you'll always be recovering your costs. That's one of our principal uh, features is we want to ensure that you guys are recovering all of your costs, not only the actual on-site job expenses, but also the additional costs that go along with it, right? Labor burden when it comes to labor, overhead when it comes to overall company expenses and so on and so forth. And last but not least, when you're using our priceless tool in LMN for estimating, please be aware or just note that we are going to make sure that every single line item that you quote out or that you include in a proposal will guarantee you guys some profit, right? And of course, that's why you're here. That's why you're looking at a software to help your business. We want to make sure that we are profitable. Well, LMN is going to help you guys get there and we're going to guarantee that you guys have a profit margin or a profitable line item on every single entry that you make into your system. Now, before we kind of really get into the bells and whistles here of the actual priceless tool in LMN, there are a couple little things that you guys will want to get set up in your accounts. So first thing I want to do before before I start walking through the different categories or the different areas of the price list is basically take a look at one thing that you guys should be getting set up in your accounts to get started with. So let me just share my screen with everybody here. So there it is. Now, under your price list tool on the left hand side, OK, you're going to be noticing some different categories or some different headings for different features within the price list tool, right? Labor, equipment, materials material categories, subs, other, and so on and so forth. Now, we're not going to be going through every single one of these today, but what we are going to be talking about are some of the major things that you guys are going to want to get set up. Now, we'll be talking about some of these other features or some of the other pieces of the priceless tool over some of our, our sorry, over some of our other live virtual trainings as you guys progress over the next two weeks. So the first thing that does need to get set up for yourselves, though, are your taxes. Now, taxes, look, we know that you, you know, they're a necessary evil, right? You have to charge them, you have to pay them, right? It's kind of like death and taxes, right? It's just one of those horrible things that we really don't want to talk about, but mm, we kind of do. So in this case here, what we want you guys to do is basically enter in the taxes that you pay as well as the taxes that you charge, okay? So whether this be a state tax, whether it be a city tax, whether it be a uh, country tax, okay, whatever the case may be, you need to enter them in here. To do so, you're going to click that add new button up in the top right hand corner and you're going to enter in that taxes name. So in my situation, I live in Toronto, which is just, a, you know, basically one big piece of Ontario, for instance. So I would want to add in the different taxes that we have in Toronto, for instance, like our HST or our GST or our PST. Not going to go into a long discussion about that. So if I wanted to add in our harmonized sales tax, I would just enter in HST right? Very, very straightforward. I would enter in its description. So this would be our harmonized sales tax, okay? Enter that in. And yes, I'm getting a little message right now that says you've already got a tax with this one set up. I'm just providing you guys with the basic example. Now down the very bottom, I have to indicate what this HST amount is is as an actual percentage. So is it 13%? Is it 15%? Is it five? Is it, is it 10? Whatever that percentage might be. Now, when you're entering in this information, you may notice at the very bottom that you also have the options here to identify this one as a purchasing credit. So in your purchasing taxes, when you guys are going to be setting those up, you do have the ability Enter in a purchasing credit. So if any of the vendors that you are currently working with offer you a kickback or a credit program based on how much you are buying from them, 
well, then you can enter it in as a purchase and credit, right? And of course, that will accumulate on your in your QuickBooks account, as well as on the vendor side of things, right? They'll be tracking how much you've purchased and how much you've earned in credit that you guys can apply on a next order moving forward. Now, before I answer that question that was just submitted, let me just talk about this one last option when it comes to setting up a tax. This is the piggybacked feature or the piggyback tax. And in many, many cases, a lot of people don't know what these are. Piggyback taxes are taxes that basically are applied consecutively, if that makes any sense. So to give you an example, okay, in Ontario or more specifically in Toronto, okay, years ago, we used to have provincial sales tax, PST, and a goods and services tax, GST, with different percentage amounts. The GST or goods and services tax was 7%. And the provincial sales tax was 8%. So when you guys were doing or when we were selling anything, we would apply that goods and services tax first to the cost of whatever we were selling. It would provide us with a subtotal. And then on that subtotal, we would apply the 8% uh, provincial sales tax. Okay, That's a piggybacked sales tax. One gets applied first. Then when you get that subtotal, you apply the second one. Now, you're probably thinking, well, why don't you just add the two together? Well, back then, you couldn't just do that because the actual mathematical calculation that happened would have been way off and you would have ended up losing money or undercharging your customer or incorrectly taxing your customer, for instance. But since then... And in today's age, okay, we have combined it. So we do have the HST or our harmonized sales tax, which combines both our provincial and our goods and services taxes together in one amount to be applied at one time. So got a question here. Uh, do, 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 do. Manuel asked, so this could be state material sales taxes. So if you're, so um, Manuel, if you're talking about the purchasing credit, okay, do you get a credit back for purchasing materials? Or a credit applied to your account? No. Okay, so that's what the purchasing credit is, okay? Now, the tax as a whole that you would be setting up, okay, if you have a state sales tax that you need to A, charge, Okay, you need to get it set up in your account. So you could just call it your state tax or whatever the case may be. I mean, I'm not sure what state you're in. Okay, it's not like I have all of your details. So if you're in a particular state and you have a, a state sales tax that you need to charge on everything, make sure that it gets added into your account in Element. Okay, now additionally, once you've added in all of your taxes and you have your list of all your taxes, up in the top right hand corner, you're going to see a little note here that says you want to set up your defaults. And at first, okay, this is done in three basic steps. The first step is identifying what taxes need to be applied when you are buying. Okay, so when you are purchasing from your vendors, do you have to spend, are there taxes on hardscape materials, softscape materials? Are your subcontractors charging you a tax or any of the other items that you are currently buying? Do they have a sales tax when you are buying? When you finish that page, click on next. It will then take you to sales tax. Where are you charging sales tax on labor, on equipment items, hardscape items, softscape items? If you are using a subcontractor and you are billing out for that subcontractor, are you charging tax on that subcontractor? Okay, and again, just itemize or just select from the dropdown from any of the taxes that you have created in your account. From there, it'll ask you if you want to finish. Now, I want everybody to understand here that the taxes can be set up before you guys start building out your price list or it can be set up afterwards or during, okay? It really doesn't matter when you guys set this up. So essentially, when you are done with your price list or as you are building out your price list, 
you do have the option to update all of your item catalog or your price list items as you go by clicking on this update catalog items with these defaults, okay? So again, if you're you know halfway through setting up your price list and now you're setting up your taxes, don't worry. You don't have to go through everything one by one. You can mark everything by default right now, all right? So click on that update my catalog items, click on finish, and it will update everything in your catalog for you, okay? Keeps things really, really simple and straightforward. So essentially, what are the things that we want to recommend when it comes to setting up your price list? Okay, number one, when you're setting up your price list in LMN, you want to set them up for or set it up for all of your divisions within your company. So if you do maintenance, you do design build, you do irrigation, you do snow removal, you want to ensure that all the pricing that is built into the LMN price list for your LMN comp uh, company's account you have everything that covers all divisions of work, okay? Also, make sure that you are using the correct budget when you're setting up your pricing in the price list, okay? We wanna make sure that you guys are using your current active numbers versus using old outdated numbers, right? Can remember, things change year after year, all right? And again, as a quick reminder, the price list is shared amongst anybody who has access within your company to your LMN account. All right. So remember that this provides with or provides everybody in the company with consistent pricing moving forward. All right. So all that being said, we've covered off our taxes. So what's the first thing that we want to start taking a look at? Well, we want to start taking a look at your labor items, what you are going to be charging for labor, right? How is it to be priced out? So exactly what is that and where do we find that? So the first thing is, is we want to manage our labor costs by calculating the actual on-site costs that we have involved for our labor, whether it be a lead hand, a crude lead, or a general uh, laborer. Okay, doesn't matter. We need to get that all set up so that we understand what their true cost is, plus what we need to make sure that we're charging as a correct price moving forward. Now, when you guys are doing this, when you are entering in your labor items, you do have the ability to also add in or account for unbillable time or as a percentage. So just to kind of give everybody a quick little overview, and I'm going to zoom in so it makes it really easy for you guys to be able to see this. For those of you that are primarily doing installation, okay, just to kind of give you guys some framework around this, that companies that include unbillable time in their estimates is around 10 to 15%. So it's not everybody, all right? So again, this is entirely up to you. But I just wanted to give you guys some of the, not necessarily industry averages, but just some of the um, the breakdowns of what comp or how companies are basically charging for unbillable time. Uh, the individuals that are not including unbillable time in their estimates is around twenty to thirty percent of landscaping companies. And if you look at maintenance landscaping companies, you know they're ten to twenty or twenty five to thirty five. Okay, so. Just as a reminder, right? Unbillable is any time that you are not directly charging your customers for, right? So that we're looking at drive time, loading and unloading, you know, meetings and all that kind of stuff, right? It depends on if you guys want to build that into your price or to recover, you know, an hour's worth of driving time for your customers, then you can put in that, you know, 10%. So one hour out of a 10 hour day, is spent driving, okay? I would want to maybe account for a 10% unbillable time as a markup so that I can recover that loss revenue or that law, that additional cost I have when my crews are driving. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So while we're actually building out our labor price list, I'll show you guys what I mean by that and how it actually gets done. So First things first, we want to jump into our labor category of LMN. And why am I not able to share my screen? There we go. 
So if I share my screen now under my price list and under my labor category, this is where we're going to be adding in or creating the billable line items that will get included on estimating, which we'll learn a little bit about later on today. But more importantly, we want to start putting together our pricing. Now, when we do this, we're going to click on this plus new button up in the top right hand corner, and we're going to be entering in that line item which is basically viewable by your customer when you're putting together your actual estimates. So this is going to be that billable line item that you are going to be charging for. So here I might want to put down that this is going to be a, uh, a landscaping crew, right? I'm going to keep things very generic for now. Now, one of the things that we suggest you guys do when you're creating your individual item names is in brackets, just indicate how many crew members or how many employees are going to be on this crew, right? This is my landscaping crew. So I'm going to say that there's three individuals on this crew and I'm going to put it in brackets. I'll explain why in a couple minutes, okay? Because again, it's going to be very, very important or it's, it's kind of like a little trick if it were, right? If we've got a landscaping crew, three. Why do we put three? You'll see in a second. Now, under its, out, or under its units, it will always default to hours, okay? So it's hours and minutes that you're going to be charging for. Now, in the description, this can be customer-facing, okay? So if you want to put in a little note here about what this landscaping crew is that can be shared with the customer, then make sure that you put that in there. If you don't want anything there, that's totally fine as well. Now, at the very bottom, you've got your internal notes. These are internal only. These are not customer facing and cannot be customer facing. So if there's any notes that you want to apply about this crew or about this particular line item, you can add it into the internal notes. Okay, It will not be visible to your customer. Now, up in the top right, I now have my cost and break even calculator. How can I price out or how do I calculate its actual cost? So in this case here, I'm going to use my average wage and click on the little calculator button. And what this is now going to do for me is pull up some information that we entered into our budget under the field labor section. So here I have a crew lead or I've got a lead hand or I've got maintenance labor or whatever the case may be. Remember, these were all individual lines or staff that I entered into my budget. So my landscaping crew is going to have one lead hand and I'm going to have two maintenance laborers, for instance. And when I create that crew of three individuals, it's going to calculate and provide me with an average price per man hour, okay? So although I've got three employees on this crew, it's calculating this out to the individual man hour calculation for me, okay? I've also got 1.19% um, overhead or sorry, overtime recovery on this as a markup being applied. Remember when you guys were forecasting your labor costs in your budget, you indicated how many billable hours they each individual would have or each type of employee would have, plus any overtime that those employees would have. Remember, we want to account for that additional cost of time and a half. So I'll click on OK. So as of right now, I know that each of those employees on average cost me $20.48. I'm going to mark that $20.48 up by 1.9 or sorry 1.19% to account for any overtime if there's any overtime paid on this, okay, or any overtime accumulated on this. I can also mark up an additional 18%, okay, for labor burden, right? And remember what labor burden is, those additional charges that you have as an employer, okay? income taxes or, um, uh, wow, unemployment insurance, RRSP, or, um, you know, any, you know, uh, income co tax contributions and so on and so forth over and above what you pay per hour. And then of course, we've got our overhead recovery of 34.4%. So that $20 and 48 cents that it costs me per employee on this crew Basically, my gross cost on this employee or these employees is for each individual $32.86, okay? 
didn't we already factor labor burden in in the budget? Yes, you did. So great question, Manuel. So you did factor it in because you identified what your cost is. But remember what we're doing here in the price list. We, now what we're doing is we're trying to determine what our price needs to be so that we recover all of our costs, right? So in the budget, you identified what your labor burden costs are, right? And figured out what that markup needs to be, right? So that 18% that I just walked through here or that Jay talked about in the budgeting portion earlier, that is basically the percentage calculation of what you have as, an, as a markup. So now we need to apply that markup so that we can calculate out our actual price. Does that make sense, Manuel? Yes, right? So, so this item will be used for estimates as a line item to calculate price? Absolutely, yes. Okay, you're very welcome. So at this point here, okay, we know that we've got $32.86 in, in associated costs, right? Cost of labor, cost of overtime, cost of bonuses, if you've included that in your budget as well, plus labor burden. So at $32.86, if that's what I charge per hour, I'm not going to lose any money. All my costs are covered. I'm just not going to be making any money on top of that. So the price calculator is now going to determine what is my final sell price to my customers. So if I sell, if I use my profit margin from my budget, which was 10%, I need to charge $36.51. Okay. Everybody should know, understand that when you guys are first setting up a line item, whether it be labor, equipment, materials, or subcontractors, by default, it will always use your budget's custom profit, or sorry, calculated profit margin to figure out what your final customer price would be, okay? So in this case, 10%, $36.51. So I'm basically making roughly what? Uh, three dollars and change per hour okay now if i want to change this okay if i want more who doesn't want more if i want more maybe i want a higher or healthier profit margin maybe i want 15 percent net profit margin if I wanted 15% profit margin on my labor, I'm now going to charge $38.66, okay? Now, keep in mind that if I switch from my profit margin from budget as the default to one of these custom pricing options, going forward, this pricing will be applied for everybody in the company. Keep that in mind, okay? So if... I sign on and we're using the cuff, the profit margin from budget. When Jay signs on, he's using the profit margin from budget, okay? If I've changed it to the custom profit margin of $38.66, well, if Jay creates an estimate with this landscaping crew, it will also be at $38.66, okay? So it basically overrides that default. Now, because I don't like pennies, Okay, on my actual billable, I'm going to set a custom price. And if we're at $38.66 now, I might want to just round this up to a flat $40. And at $40 per man hour, okay, I'm making 17.85% profit, okay, on top of my overall calculation, right? So at $40, I'm making roughly $7 and what, 14 cents per man hour in labor, okay? Now, Unbillable. If you want to account for that one hour of driving time per day out of a 10 hour workday or 10%, okay, I can apply this here in my unbillable calculation. All right, so I'm going to apply an unbillable 10%. Now, this also becomes part of my markup, right? This is a cost that I want to recover. So remember that my pricing is now jumped to $36.15. But also note, because I'm using a custom price of $40, my 17% profit has now dropped to 9.62, okay? So always remember when you guys are making any adjustments to your basic cost, you should always have your price calculated out to the profit margin from your budget to get started with. 
And then from there, you can adjust. So custom mar profit margin from budget at, at 10% is $40.17. I want 15 points minimum. So that's $42.53, but I just want to make that a nice round number. So I'm going to make it $45. Okay. So at $45, I'm making roughly $8.85 per man hour. Okay. So when I'm actually putting together an estimate, this landscaping crew of three individuals, it's not $45 for the whole crew per hour. It's $45 for each one of those employees. So roughly $135 per hour for that crew, okay, is what's going to be charged. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody, okay? So we do recommend that when you guys are adding in labor items into your calculator, okay, you do in brackets, just put a little indicator as to how many employees are going to be on that crew when you're building it out, okay? So... Best practices when you guys are putting together your labor items, set up your crews based on the type of work that they're doing, an install crew, a maintenance crew, a fertilization crew, a gardening crew, and so on and so forth. Use our average wage calculator to easily calculate the price when you're creating your crews. We recommend that you also set up multiple crew variations based on different skill sets or crew size, right? So again, I could have a landscape crew of three employees, a landscape crew of four employees, a landscape crew of six employees, whatever the cases may be. And again, if you want to include unbillable percentages, make sure you include it when you're calculating out your final price, okay? It just makes things a little bit easier and also ensuring that you're recovering all of your initial costs. We now want to move on to our equipment, right? And we want to show you guys how you can set up equipment to be billed out in your price list, right? Because we want you to manage your equipment costs. As you learned when you guys were setting up your budget in LMN, you have costs associated with the equipment that you use in the field. Crow trucks, skid steers, excavators, right? Um, quick cut saws, uh, a material, a maintenance trailer, a design build trailer, a fertilization truck, right? You have costs associated with this. Recover those costs by charging for your equipment. So we want to determine what its actual cost is so that we can determine what our actual final selling price is actually going to be. So in LMN, we now need to add that in. So if we go into our price list once again, and we start taking a look at our equipment, okay, remember in the budget, you had those four classifications, owned, leased, custom, okay, and other, or and grouped, right? So in the price list, we don't have those, but we do have something else. We'll click on plus new, and we'll add in a new vehicle. So in this case, I'm going to put in my fertilization truck. Okay. And here, this is a vehicle or it's a piece of equipment. You classify it as you need to. And how do we want to charge for this? Do we want to charge by the hour or do we want to charge by the day? Well, when it comes to fertilization, I mostly do residential fertilization. So I want to just bill by the hour or at least identify the units in which this could be charged by the actual hour. If, it were, if I were doing commercial, maybe I would be doing by the day because that truck is going to be on a job site for the entire day fertilizing a very large property or maybe a golf course, okay, or whatever the case may be. I can put in its description, again, viewable or visible to the customer based on if you, uh, if you allow that. And internal notes, again, internal only, not viewable to your customer. Now, at the very bottom, You'll notice here that there's a trailer cost calculator. If I click on that little button, okay, essentially this will allow me to cost out or price out, okay, a trailer, for instance. So if we're using a trailer, okay, like a maintenance trailer or a design build trailer or whatever the case may be, okay, I can use this little spreadsheet to help me with it. And let me just pull it over here so you guys can actually see what I'm talking about. This is basically a calculator to show you guys how a trailer can get calculated. We'll provide you with some examples down the very bottom, like a maintenance trailer that has a riding mower, 
walk behind some line trimmers some backpack blowers and so on and so forth right and it basically is an eight dollar and twenty cent cost per hour for this trailer if i look at a construction trailer five dollars and eighty cents if i look at a snow example seventeen dollars and thirty three cents and of course you guys can build out as many trailers as you need to okay using the tabs at the very bottom okay again it's completely available to you to help you guys out with determining what your actual pricing is going to be now up in the top right hand corner i'm going to click on this little calculator so i can identify the pricing for my fertilization truck i'm going to click on that little calculator and at the top of the page i'm going to first indicate if this piece of equipment is owned or if i'm financing it I also want to indicate how many billable hours per year will I have on this equipment. So again, remember, you kind of already did this in your budget. So it's a good idea to maybe have your budget open in another tab or on another screen so you can kind of reflect or go back to it for reference. You want to indicate how many hours in a typical day that you have on that vehicle. And you'll notice here as well that you've got an import from budget button. If you click on this, Anything that you classified as owned in your budget will appear in this drop down and help you to calculate out your actual pricing. So if I select on anything in here, okay, I know that my uh, my fert truck or my fertilization truck is currently leased. So in this case, it's not going to show up on this list for me. OK, but if it was something that I was financing or that I owned outright, it would be available here for me. So in this case, this is an actual lease. So I'm going to go on to financing or owned. And I'm going to enter in what my actual price is of that fertilization truck, and it's going to be seventy five thousand dollars. And my down payment on that truck was another well, five. And my end, my annual finance rate is 0.9%. Okay. And my term on this is going to be 60 months. Okay. So that's going to be a five-year term. And at the end of it, okay, it will be worth roughly $15,000. Okay. At the end of that period, I also need to calculate out, that's my base cost on this, but now I need to figure out what my additional costs are on this. Maintenance and repair, insurance and licensing. Now you're probably also thinking, well, Chris, we already did this, right? We did this when we were identifying our equipment budget, right? We did at the very top left-hand corner, we identified the cost of all of our fuel repairs and miscellaneous costs that we have with all of our equipment. That's right. Yes, you did do this before, but you summarized or subtotaled all of your gas pricing or all of your gas cost, your repair costs and your insurance costs, right? In one number. What we want to do now here is identify what this truck has as far as maintenance and repairs, insurance and licensing, okay? So in this case here, I plan on spending zero on maintenance and repair because it's built into my lease agreement. My insurance on this, however, is probably going to be around $1,200 per year. And my annual, actually, it'd probably be more than that, probably be more like $1,800 a year. And my annual licensing on this that I've got to pay is $125. So that's the actual true cost of my fertilization truck. Now down the bottom, I need to identify fuel costs. How much fuel will this truck consume at any given time or on average? So right now, average fuel price in Toronto is $1.65 a liter, okay? And $1.65 per liter, and it consumes roughly 15 liters of gas per day. So the true cost on my truck or the ROI on this one, my hourly is $14.92 and my daily is $119. Now to make this easy, I'm going to just simply say that my typical workday is 10 hours. So I'm at $14.31 per hour, but on a 10 hour day, I need to charge $143.10. If I click OK, okay, it will then give me my price calculation. 
cost per hour, 1431. 10 hours per day, overhead recovery markup of 25% to give me a base cost of $17.89. Plus 10%, $19.88. Okay? If I want 20% on my trucks, okay? My price is now $22.36 per hour. Or if I set a custom price and say that I want $25 per hour, oops, not 15, $25 per hour, okay? $25 per hour or $250 per day, okay? So again, custom price will override my company default for not only myself, but for everybody else who uses this line item on an estimate moving forward, okay? So best practices when it comes to setting up your equipment is basically ensuring that you're only entering in larger equipment that you are estimating for. So anything that you are going to be charging for, make sure that you've entered it into your budget or sorry, into your price list. Set up your equipment by equipment type. Make sure that you include different equipment packages. And if you have anything that you have financed or that you are owning, import it directly from your budget to save you some time, okay? So now we wanna talk about your materials, right? What you guys are going to be reselling to your customer as a material price list. So we guys, we wanna ensure that we are managing our material costs, right? So that we are again, making sure that we are recovering our costs, taxes, purchasing taxes, and so on and so forth that you guys are gonna be entering into your price list. So in LMN, we then wanna start looking at the materials. So if I go to my material section, you'll notice number one, that this looks a little bit different, okay? And it's because depending on how you guys are set up with your subscription to LMN, there are gonna be different features that are available and different features that are not available. So with professional and enterprise levels, you'll be able to use our marketplace feature as well as our vendors directory. And also you'll be able to use our site one interface for my United States friends only, okay? I wish I could say the same that this is available in Canada, but currently the site one login or the site one feature is currently not available in Canada, okay? This is a US feature only. And you're probably wondering, well, what is it? To get started, okay, the Site One feature for those of you that are working or that are buying from Site One, okay, this is a simple integration that you guys could use to basically build out your price list with Site One specific materials. So if I log into Site One with my username and password that I log into that vendor directory, Okay, I can put that information in here and sign in, and then I can search up any of the actual materials that I buy from site one. Now, one of the things, just to kind of give everybody an idea here, I've already done this uh, in a, uh, earlier. So if I go to site one hardscapes, for instance, these are all materials that I buy through site one that have already been populated in my actual element price list for me. Okay, so again, it's some automation so that you guys are not doing manual entry when you're entering in line items, okay? Now, to add line items or to add new billable items or resaleable items to your price list, there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can click on plus new up in the top right-hand corner and choose a category on where this actual price list material is going to go, right? We're a big advocate for organization. So what you guys should be doing is in your price list is building out categories for all of your different materials. You can even, and as a suggestion by myself, set up a category for the vendors that you buy from. Canadian Tire, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Ace Hardware, okay? Home hardware for my Canadian friends. Ace hardware and home hardware, by the way, guys, exactly the same, just Ace is in US, home hardware is in Canada. Now, again, setting up these categories is just going to keep things organized and a single material can be applied to multiple categories within your price list, just like tags in your CRM. But we'll talk about that a little bit later on. 
So again, under my price list, under my categories, create categories, softscapes, hardscapes, uh, maintenance materials, design build materials, okay, stone, rock, however way you guys want to do it, you guys can create as many different categories as you want. Now, when I'm setting up my materials, when I'm adding in a particular material, so if I go into new, and let's say I want to add in a new fertilizer that we're doing, like a weed control or pest control. So I'm going to call this weed and pest control. I should call weed and grub, but whatever. Okay, I'm going to put this in my fertilizer category, right? So I'm going to look for fertilizers, okay? And this is where it's going to go. It's going to go into my master fertilizer category. And this one, I buy it by the bag, okay? And it comes in a 60 pound bag. So I'm going to sell it by each bag or whatever the case may be. It's a softscape. I, if I have a SKU number that I normally buy from, I would enter it in here and so on and so forth. Fill out my information. Now, in this case, I'm going to enter in its unit cost. So for each 60 pound bag that I buy, I spend $49.99 on that. I don't pay any shipping on it. I could pick it up. And there is no warranty on fertilizer. Now, I have to apply a purchasing tax. So I'm going to apply my HST to this, which means that $49.99 bag of fertilizer is actually going to cost me $64.96. And in turn, I'm going to sell each bag of fertilizer to my customer for $72.18 with a 10% budgeted net profit margin. Or if I want 20%, on all of my materials, it's going to be $81. Or if I want to set a custom price, I'm just going to make it 85. Okay. So again, keeps things really nice and easy. All right. So that's method number two, right? Download from site one, or you build them in manually. Another feature that you guys can use in Element to speed up this process is by importing your actual vendor's price list. If they send it to you in Excel, Okay, you can use our sample file, which looks like this. And you can populate all of this information, the name of the product, the ID number or SKU number, what type of product is it, the sizing that it's available in, the cost, the pricing, and so on and so forth. Copy and paste, okay? Save this file as a CSV file. So when you go to file and of course, save as, Okay, it's going to ask you to save it as a comma delimited file. Okay, this is a data entry file, right? We're going to be using this to import back into LMN. So it does need to be saved as a CSV, not as an XS or an XS or XLS or an XLSX file. Wow. It does need to be saved as a .csv file. Okay, by saving it as a .csv file, it will allow you to upload it directly into LMN. When you are doing that, it will ask you to choose a file. So you will find that file that you've saved or that you've created on your computer. I would highly advise you guys create a desktop folder, price lists, vendor price lists. So that way they're easy for you to find. And when you're doing that import, when a match is found, update the existing item. Do not add new items, only update existing items or only update cost and pricing. Do not update name description or other fields or your final option. Even if a match is found, create a new material item. Okay. I would highly advise you watch how you use this one. Okay. You don't want to be duplicating all of your line items in your price list. Okay. One line item keeps things really nice and easy. Okay. So that's doing it basically in bulk rather than doing singular individual data entry. Okay, nobody has time to do that. So best practices around your price list for materials. Okay, use a consistent naming convention. Use the import feature versus doing things manually. Create your categories for different types of materials and vendors that you buy from which will allow you guys to export materials, adjust, and then re-import to update your pricing. 
as well as to add or replace categories in bulk to the pricing that you've already got in your system. It does keep things really nice and easy for you. Now, for those of you using subcontracting, we want to walk through how you guys can set up your subcontractor price list so that you can manage your subcontractor costs, what they charge you versus what you guys need to pay or what you need to charge your customers for. So in LMN, we need to set up our subcontractor pricing. So if we go back into our system and we go into our subs level, okay, we want to identify how we want to bill out for our different subcontractors. So click on plus new in the very top right-hand corner and enter in the subcontractor name. Now, word of advice to everybody. Do not put in the actual name of the company of the subcontractor. So for instance, don't put in Davies Deck and Fencing, okay? Or Jay's Jungle Gym Installation, okay? Put in that they do carpentry or that they do irrigation or that they do playground builds, okay? Whatever the case may be. The reason I'm suggesting this, guys, is because when you guys enter in Davies Deck and Fencing, for instance, okay, as the subcontractor for any carpentry or deck and fencing work, when you send that estimate over to the customer, they're going to see deck and fence that you guys are going to be billing for them. You're going to charge them maybe $15,000 for a new fence or a new deck or both, okay? And they're going to see Davies Deck and Fencing. What's to stop that customer from picking up the phone and calling the Davies Deck and Fencing and getting a direct quote? Hey, I just got a quote for a deck and fence for $15,000. was just wondering if you guys could do better. They come over, they do a quick little walk around the property, which they've already done, by the way. They come back over and they call the customer back up and say, yeah, you know what? We can do that for 12 minimizing or basically weakening your opportunity to get another $15,000 worth of bulk revenue, okay? So again, do not put the actual name of the landscaping company, but what type of landscaping work that that subcontractor does, okay? So again, if you're going to put down Davies Deck and Fencing, I would just put down Deck and Fencing, okay? And it helps if you spell it right, okay? So deck and fencing, okay? Do I charge a flat rate? Do I charge by the hour? How do I charge for this, okay? So in this case here, I'm gonna just put in here a flat rate, okay? I can put in a description and then in the internal notes, this is where I can put in Davies deck and fencing so I know who to call, right? 905-555-2244, okay? That's their phone number. Again, internal notes, not visible to the customer. So the unit cost field, I can put in what does Dave or fencing normally charge me for a deck and a fence, or I can leave this at zero. When you guys are estimating with subcontractors, if you leave this unit cost at zero, it will leave you a line item or a field in the actual estimate. You'll learn this a little bit later on today, but you'll basically have a field on the estimate that's left at zero. So if Davies Deck and Fencing comes back to you and says, okay, we're going to charge you Big Mac Landscaping, we're going to charge you $11,500 to do that deck and fence for that customer, you would enter in its cost there. It will automatically identify the purchasing tax, overhead recovery markup, and if you guys want to use a custom profit margin from your budget at 10%, what that price is going to be, okay? Keeps things really simplified for you. So... When it comes to subcontractors, set up the subcontractors by their type of work. And remember to enter the amount that the subcontractor is charging you in the cost or leave it at zero, okay? Depending on how they're going to be charging you. Now, our last field or our last area in our price list is going to be our other items, okay? We've talked about labor, equipment, materials that you are buying from your vendors and reselling to your customers your subcontractors, and any other items that you guys are going to be charging for. Now, these can be things like disposal fees that you know, you're being charged for as technically 
Uh, I, I'm not going to go down that road. But if you're paying job disposal fees, you might want to charge that back to your customer as well. If you're being charged for a permit, okay, a build permit or whatever, okay, you want to charge your customer for that as well, right? Now, keep in mind that the other category, this entire area of the price list does not have any overhead recovery markup, only cost plus profit margin, okay? So keep that in under or keep that in mind when you're starting to build out your actual pricing. So in this case here, if I go into my account and I look at my other items, right? I might want to look at like a delivery charge, right? My vendor's going to charge me $250 for a delivery charge. I'm going to mark that $250 up to $300, which is going to be 5.83% profit. If I use my 10% from my budget, it's $313 or I can make it $350, okay? So my vendor charges me $250, I'm going to charge my customer $350. I don't need any overhead on this. I'm not doing any of the work, okay? My vendor is doing the delivery, not me, okay? So I'm going to just get a little bit more revenue on this. So they're going to charge me $250. I'm going to charge $350. I'm going to make $100 on every delivery that my vendors charge me for, okay? Now, I can look at my excavator that I'm renting, a disposal fee, a permit fee that I'm charged by the city or the state, whatever the case may be. So if my city charges me $250, I can charge $300, okay? And so on and so forth. But remember, guys, that there is no overhead recovery applied or marked up to the cost of anything in the other category, okay? So best practices around your other category, again, use for job items that you do not need to recover overhead on. Just remember, if it doesn't take any work on your part to do or to basically acquire that or to charge your customer for it, then don't apply recovery. And of course, make sure that it's in your other category. Okay, and only a custom or only a profit margin will get applied to this. So guys, that's basically your price list. Now, before I let you guys leave and before I let you guys go to lunch, just like Jay did a little bit earlier with a budgeting poll, I'm gonna do the same thing when it comes to a price list. So understanding what you guys learned from, from me today and how the price list works, okay? answer those three questions that you see on your screen regarding the price list. Okay, very, very straightforward, very, very simplified. Okay, and again, do your best to go through that. Now, to recap what we've covered off here today, we discussed the element price list and why it's important for consistent and profitable pricing. So understanding what your costs are and all of your related markups to require or to acquire all of your costs or recover all of your costs is very, very important. But what's more important is making sure that you guys have a profit margin applied to these so that you know that every single line item that you are billing for is going to be profitable, okay? And we also gave you a good understanding of what each of the different sections are within the price listing tool and what each section will do for when you guys are estimating moving forward, okay? Now, if you have any questions about anything that's been covered in this session, please feel free to go into that chat or that Q&A box at the very bottom of your screen. I will be more than happy to walk you guys through. Additionally, wanted to just remind everybody or let you guys know, this is your first session, so wanted to let you guys know that if there are any virtual training sessions that you guys would like to attend, either again or recommend to a colleague at work, or in your office, please remember that you guys have instant access to any of our virtual trainings and to register for any of our virtual trainings at any time. So if you were to hop into your LMN account, which I'll show you guys right now, under your help and resources menu in the bottom, under live virtual training, under those help and resources, we'll take you to our LMN page where you guys can see what's being offered here we have today. I know exactly what's being held today. Build your budget, CRM and maintenance. Tomorrow we've got CRM and design build estimates.
job costing for design build, and so on and so forth. So you'd be able to see which sessions are available on any given day of a calendar month. And by the way, just to kind of give everybody an idea, we are booked out, or sorry, we do have everything available throughout August. Okay, and going into September should be up within the next 24 to 48 hours. Okay. Now, additionally, you also have access to a new endeavor that's happening very, very shortly, which is our four day training program in person. Okay. These are going to be beginner and advanced level training, but are done in person at our office here in Markham, Ontario. So if you're interested in this session, again, go to the main LMN webpage. So again, let me just walk you guys through it here. Okay, so if you go to goelemen.com and you go to resources and under Academy Certification Program, you'll be able to see that we've got our Element Academy as well as a snow day program coming up very, very shortly. So if you guys are doing any snow removal work, we will be actually hosting sessions live and in person for um, in-person training as well as how to use LMN for snow, okay? So all that being said, guys, I wanted to thank everybody for joining me today. So please stay well, stay safe, I'm sure I will probably see you guys again a little bit later this afternoon for our next session, for our PM session. But anyway, stay well, stay safe. And on behalf of Jay and myself, take care, everybody. Have a great one. All right. Bye-bye.